Thanks so much, Father. It's a pleasure to be here with you all, and uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to journey with you over these next three days. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I bring you greetings from the six Buffalo seminarians at St. Mary's Seminary University in Baltimore in order to prepare themselves to be your servants and shepherds. Joe Franz, Deacon Joe Tokas, whom you just heard and know well, Jeff Donovan, John Willett, C.J. Wild, who many of you know also, and Greg Zini. They pray for you daily, and I ask that you keep them in your prayers. If there ever was a time when we needed only good priests, I would say that time is past. We need holy priests. We need saint priests. So, I ask each of you to pray for these men that they might grow in holiness, in wisdom, and in love. They are excited to serve you. And each of them looks forward to that day when they will be equipped by the Lord Jesus to be sacramental instruments of his mercy. I'm proud to say that I know each of them personally, and it has been a distinct honor and privilege to teach them over the years that they have been in formation. They are not just my students, but my friends, my brothers in Christ. Please remember them before the Lord. I can assure you that they do the same for all of you and all the people, all of God's people in Buffalo. Brothers and sisters, our Old Testament reading today reminds us of God's opening a path in the midst of the sea for the exodus of the children of Israel from their bondage in Egypt. The psalm delights in Zion's liberation from exile and captivity. These stories of liberation and restoration teach us always that the God we worship is on the side of the oppressed, the downtrodden, the weak, the sick, those who are most need of his mercy. As Jesus instructs us, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have to come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But it is important to keep in mind, as the gospel for today reminds us, that our God is also not a God who chooses between mercy and justice when he liberates, when he heals, when he restores. Rather, our God is one whose every work of justice always, always presupposes his mercy. After recounting the exodus from Egypt, the word of the Lord recorded for us by the prophet Isaiah proclaims, See, I am doing something new. In the desert, I make a way. Now, I ask you, although it's been a while, to think back to the first Sunday in Lent. Where did our gospel begin? Where was our gospel located? We were with Jesus in the desert, accompanying him during his temptation. And where will we find ourselves as Lent draws to a close and opens on to the sacred triduum. We will be in a garden, accompanying Christ in his hour of prayer. Elsewhere in the book of Isaiah, we are told that the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden her desert like the garden of the Lord. 
Now this topography of Lent suggests, as you've heard many times and in many ways, that Lent is a journey, an itinerarium, a pilgrimage, which stands as an annual symbol of the pilgrimage of life. And our reading from St. Paul exhorts us to embrace this pilgrimage, to continue in hope, forgetting what lies behind and straining for what lies toward, what lies ahead. The life which we are called to as Christians, however, this life of holiness to which we are all called, cannot be achieved except through participation in and imitation of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Second Vatican Council teaches us that the Lord Jesus, the divine teacher and model of all perfection, preached holiness of life to each and every one of his disciples of every condition of every station. So St. Paul intimates to us in our reading that he wants, he wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings. How? By becoming like him in his death. Now Pope Francis has taught us that true holiness consists in experiencing, in union with Christ, the mysteries of his life. So let's turn to the example of his life, to our gospel reading for today. It's a famous passage, one cited frequently, especially in regards to judgmentalism. In last week's gospel, we heard another famous passage, perhaps the most well-known of all of Jesus' parables, the parable of the prodigal son, as it's usually referred to. But many exegetes suggest that maybe, although it's certainly about a prodigal son, that perhaps the reason that Jesus told it was not so much because of the prodigal son but because of the merciful Father. So this is a parable of the merciful Father. Now, if this is true, then it seems to me that our gospel reading for today teaches us how to imitate divine mercy. Indeed, it instructs us how to become divine mercy to others not by choosing mercy over justice, but by restoring justice through mercy. Prior to the confrontation that Jesus has, the gospel begins by telling us that Jesus has been on the Mount of Olives. This is code. This is the evangelist's way for telling us that Jesus had been in prayer, for it was his custom to wake up early and pray. And whenever he was near, he would do so on the Mount of Olives. Now this is significant, and it's something we're going to look at together over these next three days. This is significant because it teaches us that Jesus never, never undertakes his day, never undertakes his mission of divine mercy apart from a prayerful encounter, a dialogical communion with his Father. The confrontation, the scene. It's important to recognize that there is a prophetic configuration, a particular placement of characters in this scene. For the scribes and Pharisees have positioned themselves in what the prophets would understand to be the satanic position, because they're standing in the position of accuser. Now, we see examples of this satanic typology in the book of Job and in the book of Zechariah. 
Satan is the cosmic accuser. He accuses us before God. He says, look at that sinner. Look at that failure. But Jesus does something different. And it is important to remember that Satan is a sinner too. Satan, felled by pride even before our first parents. And like we saw in Jesus' own temptations by Satan, these teachers of the law lead with Scripture. They seem to be on the side of divine justice. They even seem to be calling Jesus to administer divine justice. Isn't this part of his mission? To restore what was lost? So it is. But Jesus remains silent. So they press him again, and he doodles in the sand. Finally, he says something. Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. Silence reigns again, and the mob departs, and it's just Jesus and just the woman. After a short and powerful dialogue, Jesus says, go, and from now on, sin no more. Jesus does not overlook the woman's sin, or anyone else's, for that matter. He knows everyone's sin in the crowd. He knows each of our sins. He doesn't tell the woman or any of us that our sins are okay. What he does say is stop. Sin no more. In essence, he tells her just what St. Paul told us. Don't look back. Look forward. Push toward the prize, which is the righteousness and justice of God. If we want to be like God, then we must sin no more. We must say no to sin, just as we said no in our baptismal promises. We must be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. What Jesus teaches us today is that holiness does not merely consist in the mere avoidance of evil, the mere avoidance of sin. Holiness is not just about not getting dirty. Holiness, Jesus teaches us, is the active pursuit of virtue and mercy. The Beatitudes of Jesus don't commend merely speakers of mercy, but doers of mercy. So what I invite you to reflect with me upon in these coming days is this journey of Lent that we're on. This journey from misery to mercy, from compunction to consolation, from the desert of tribulation into the garden of the Lord. So let us remember to pray together in these coming days the words of the psalm which we heard just a moment ago. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy.